Hello and welcome to High Ridge Architecture. My name is Joshua Hightower. I am Alex Elford. And today we're going to show you the High Ridge Processor, which is the processor me and Alex constructed. Uh, so today's agenda, we are going to talk about the origin, um, our design, the architecture as an overview with the baseline and the enhancement we made for it, and our future plans and enhancements for our processor. And then we'll take final questions at the end if there are any. So the origin, uh, first the name, my last name is Hightower, his last name is Selfridge, High Ridge, since we both worked on it, just combined it. Um, our, press, our processor, we wanted to focus on a flexible design aimed at an enhanced uh, or embedded environment. Um, one of the inspirations for our processor was the uh, ARM architecture for the Neon with uh, single instruction and multiple data. Uh, so we wanted to keep the simplicity of the MIPS with adding instructions on that architecture. Um, we also wanted to extend the sim uh, simplicity of the MIPS machine. We wanted to keep um, the same type of MIPS instructions, keep it really simple, don't make it too complicated since MIPS is already pretty simple, and then make it highly expandable. We wanted to make our processor able to be used on a large market rather than a super small narrow market, um, so a bunch of different applications. And you'll see just how we implemented that in a little while. The expandableness, you mean? Yeah, the expandable. The expandable velocity, yeah. however you want to call it. So our memory is organized into four 4K by 32, or two 4K by 32 data and instruction memories, thus a Harvard architecture, um, byte addressable, um, and in big NVM format. Uh, we also have IO memory, that's 1K by 32, uses input output, which is like your loads, your stores, uh, since this is a risk machine, those are the only memory accesses. Lastly, we have 32, 32-bit registers, um, the first 16 are your normal operations, you're saving, you know, results of ads, tracks, things like that. Um, the upper 16 are special registers like your stack pointer, your return address, global pointer, uh, things like that. So here you can see how memory is actually organized. The processor can uh, talk to instruction memory, I.O. memory, and data memory. And you can see this is the how big NVM works. You can see the upper uh, byte is stored in the lower address, and the lower byte is stored in the upper address. Uh, but you'll actually see we have an instruction to reverse ND in this later, so if whatever your data, for whatever strange reason, is not in big ND format, you can make it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have two main data types. We have a 32-bit signed integer, which will update the negative, overflow, carry, and zero flag. Uh, these are used mostly in arithmetic operations. Uh, and then we also have a 32-bit unsigned integer, which will only update the overflow, carry, and zero flag, since we don't care about the negative flag in this case, which will be set to an X or a don't care. And this is only used in the add, subtract, set less than, and set less than immediate unsigned operations. And then we have two new type, uh, two new data types: a quad eight, which is four eight-bit values, both um, unsigned. Uh, no flags are currently updated in this process. And we also have a dual sixteen, which is two sixteen-bit values, um, unsigned again with no flags being updated. And you'll see, although it says no flags, the flags actually do exist, at least to carry an overflow at this point in time. They just aren't implemented. There's no instructions that actually take advantage of them. Uh, so we have our addressing nodes here. Our register is by far the most common, using one destination, RD, and two sources, RS, RT. Um, those are used in a lot of your uh, arithmetic and logic instructions. Uh, the register indirect, used for loads and stores, takes the offset, four in this case, adds it to the base register, RS. There you have your effective address calculation. Um, we have the immediate addressing mode, which is a lot like register, except instead of a second register, we're using a 16-bit immediate part of the instruction. We're going to assign and extend that to 32 bits, um, and then do the operation like normal. Uh, lastly, jumps, uh, not its own type of addressing mode, but nonetheless uh, mentioned here for uh, clarification. Uh, for the flag register, we actually added a six flag, uh, divided by zero flag. Uh, this flag is actually set only in the division operation. Um, every other operation will set it to an X or a don't care. Um, the IE is the interrupt enable, only set in the set interrupt enable instruction. It will flip the bit. If it was a zero, it would set it to a one. Uh, carry flag, set if the carry occurs out of the most significant bit, or if you're borrowing in a subtract using arithmetic operations. Overflow flag, set if the overflow occurs. This can occur on unsigned, um, and that will be set to the carry flag in that case. And we also have the negative flag, which won't be used in unsigned operations, only in signed. And that's uh, just based on the most significant bit. If it's a 1, it's negative. 0 will be positive. And then 0 flag is set if all of the bits are 0. 
Can I ask you, did you guys ever use the negative flag for anything? Uh, no, not in this case, but did we did have a use, flag there. Did you ever use the overflow flag for anything? Nope. It just, is there, we're just, uh, later on we can add instructions to use both those flags. Well, we do have two instructions that use the divide by zero flag, which we're going to go over later. So you'd have similar just like that that would test them? Right. Do you do jumps? I guess we'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out later. Yeah. These are instruction formats. Um, as for MIPS guidelines, you have your R, I, J types, um, and then lastly a B type, which is vector type. Um, intentionally resembles an R type, very similar. Um, so starting with an R type, you have um, the OPC opcode coded to zero, um, and then your two sources, RSRT, destination RD, um, a shift amount uh, for a barrel shifter we actually have implemented, and then a six bit function select I types uh, pretty similar uses uses the opcode not zero uh, one source register RS and a destination RT and then the other operand is the immediate value it's been sign extended uh, J types uh, contains the entire jump address that's going to be used in the program counter um, as well as the opcode and then lastly our V type hard coded one F that's our E key right there denotes a V type uh, two sources RS RT one destination RD, function select, just like uh, in the R type. Uh, res is reserved, um, do not use basically. And in M cells and mode select, uh, you'll see how that works in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So this is our uh, top level design. You see our control unit uh, talks to the instruction unit, um, the data path, and then the IO and data memories. Um, so going back from the instruction unit is the IR. Um, control unit needs that to know where it's going, what states to go to, and then in turn it outputs uh, chip selects, reads, writes, load enables, things like that. Um, in the data path, flags are sent back to the control unit, uh, whether saved there. Uh, it also outputs the selects and uh, denables, stuff like that. You'll notice the bus interface here. It's not a unit per se, it is more of just um, an array of wires and multiplexers allowing us to um, do transactions on those common data address lines. Um, it's not really its own dedicated unit necessarily. Um, and lastly, we have uh, the interrupt at the bottom there going to IO memory. Good to know. It is maskable. That's the interrupt enable we just saw. So this is our instruction unit. Uh, we have a, a three input uh, multiplexer three to one uh, that will take the, the, this is the jump address. And then this will be the branch address. And then this is uh, for jump register. Uh, those can be loaded in using the PC load signal. Uh, PC goes to our instruction memory, fetches the instruction, stores it into IR, and IR outputs it, sign extending the last 16 bits if we need to use it for immediate instructions. So this is our data path in general. So we have uh, these two uh, for the S address. Uh, this is so we can select the stack pointer if we're using the stack pointer to return anything from the stack or the S address for any other instructions. Um, the D address mux can select either the return address, the stack pointer, the T address, the D address, and that's selected with the DA select uh, signal coming from the control unit. And then uh, here's our uh, 32 by 32 register file, which goes to RT and RS registers. Uh, the T mux can select the uh, sign extended 32-bit or just the T coming out of the register file. Mm -hmm. And then here's two of our enhancements, the barrel shifter and the vector operations unit, which are in parallel with the ALU. Um, and you can see our divide by zero flag uh, comes out of this ALU, goes into what we call the high-low register, which has all the registers for um, all three of these units. And then they're outputted to this YMUX. Um, and we can select which output we want to use based off of the uh, y select input. So this is our ALU, this is the primary ALU, not the vector one. Um, so you'll see it's got a multiplier, a regular ALU doing things like add, subtract, um, set less than, things like that, and the divider at the bottom there. Um, and those all get fed into a MUX, and based upon whatever function we're doing, we're going to choose the appropriate value. So if you're doing a multiply, you're taking it from the multiplier, divider from the divider, so on. Uh, you'll notice the zero and negative flags there. Um, the zero flag is really just testing if the whole thing's equal to zero. Um, in this case, if it's, say, a multiply, you have a 64-bit product, it's texting a whole 64, not just 32. Mm -hmm. um, and then the negative flag, 
um, same sort of deal. If it's uh, from the ALU, it's testing the 31st bit. If it's from the divider or the multiplier, it's testing the 64th, or yeah, 63rd. Uh, for enha our enhancements, we have four main enhancements. Uh, first one, we have a 32-bit barrel shifter. Uh, our second one is an 8-bit by 16-bit vector unit, uh, which you saw on the previous slide. A divide by zero flag, and then two branching statements, divide by zero true or divide by zero false. And we have the additional instructions uh, added to the, uh, our regular ALU. So this is uh, the barrel shifter kind of zoomed in view. Um, it, it's sitting in parallel there. Um, so it takes no extra clocks or anything to use this barrel shifter. That's kind of the whole point. If you want to be able to shift up to 32 times in one clock. And so this is how we did it. Now, I, I, traditionally, it's done with a huge array of multiplexers, a case statement. Case statement. Um, I said, I want to try to make that a little bit better. I want to try to make it a little bit uh, smaller. Um, so I took advantage of Verilog. This is 100% synthesizable. I've tested it myself. Um, what it does uses Verilog's uh, left and right shift operators uh, to shift by shift amount. Um, that's pretty simple. Shift right arithmetic does the same thing. Um, just uses a for loop to uh, replicate that sign bit so you preserve the sign. Uh, lastly, we added a rotate right. And the way this works, um, it uses a temporary register. And um, if you can imagine it, uh, and I'll have a slide for this, you have your whole register and you're taking whatever you're shifting out and you're just putting it back at the top. That's how a rotate would work. So what I do is I take whatever was shifted out, store it in temporary, and the last line there is ORing it back in. That brings it back at the top after you've shifted it. So this is an example illustrating what I just said. Um, so we're going to rotate right on R1. We're going to do three nibbles, so 12 bits, uh, store it in R7. Uh, so you can see uh, in R1 there, those last three, the 100, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, those get kind of transposed to the top of it there. Uh, that's where it would be ORed in, as you saw on the last slide. Uh, so it's really simple. We thought this would be kind of useful because MIPS doesn't have a rotate. Right. Um, so it's a simple implementation of that. Can I, can I, yes. Before we go on, you, you said it's synthesizable, so that I believe. Did you ever compare what the case statement would actually use in resources versus what you were? you know, uh, combination of logic with the for loops would take as far I, as resources. I didn't actually do a, a real evaluation. I looked at RTL schematics generated by the Xilinx tools and the amount of units it put in there. Yeah. Relatively the same. About the same. So I, I didn't, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's not a huge change in hardware really. It kind of becomes the same thing. But yeah, it'd but be interesting. You, there are the tools. I know we, we haven't learned them and I don't know if you've ever learned them in 460 where you can you can find out the timing or you can find out how many uh, logical units it used in implementing it once you synthesize it. So I was just curious if you did it. It'd be interesting if it was a little less or a little faster or something like that. I, I would think it'd be faster. Yeah. I hope so. It's my design. It better be faster. You would faster. hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so we also have the vector operations unit, uh, which use the two new data types, the quad eight or the dual 16. Um, as of right now, it uses the same register set as our 32-bit counterpart in, in the MIPS machine. Um, and it's parallel unit uh, ALU in the data path. has a lot of similar functions to our regular ALU. Um, we just wanted to take um, using an SIMD unit and being able to right. use those types of instructions. We wanted to keep it simple. Right. So, you know, it, it kind of follows the same conventions as the regular uh, data path. So this is the format for the B-type. Uh, we have the 1F for our E key, then we have the RS and RT fields for our source registers, and then we have the RD field for our destination. Uh, function select, uh, right now it only uses bits 6 through 10. Then 2 through 5 is our re uh, reserve, we don't use these at the time. Uh, we can use that later for barrel shifter, or not barrel shifter, but shifting each uh, byte by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, just not implemented at the time. And then we have mode select, which is 2 bits. Um, if it's a 0, 1, it'll use quad 8. If it's a 1, 0, it'll use dual 16. Um, the reason we're using two bits is because we want to later, um, we can use a mode for zero, 00 to be a standard ALU type that goes in parallel with the other one. Mm -hmm. So it can do standard operations as well as mm -hmm. uh, dual eight, or <coughs> dual 16 and quad 8. And so this is the actual um, vector unit. You'll see it kind of looks a lot like the other ALU, sure. um, the regular um, MIPS data path. Uh, it's still got a dual mode multiplier, dual mode ALU, dual mode uh, divider, 
they all go into a wine mux, um, and the answer is chosen appropriately based on what you're doing. So this is the co-version of what you just saw. Um, just instantiates the three modules and then the mux at the end there. Uh, you'll notice that on the ALU, the C and B flags at the end there, they do exist, just left unconnected. Mm -hmm. That's part of our future plan. Um, you'll notice at the end there, the wine mux, um, it is 64-bit out no matter what. If it's an ALU operation that doesn't use the upper half, then we're going to set it to zero, and the default case is also the ALU. So this is how it actually works. Um, there's nothing crazy, there's nothing surprising here. Uh, it just breaks down into bytes. So it's going to do four at a time like mm -hmm. that. Um, so that's how the 8-bit works, and the 16-bit works exactly the same way, just splits it into two halves, uh, then just does the operation. And you'll notice the flags are actually set to don't cares. Um, eventually there will be flags for vector operations, but for now, be clear and not confusing, we'll keep them don't cares. Are you doing saturated or unsaturated ads? Uh, be unsaturated. And so here's the multiplier. Uh, it works exactly the same way as your ad subtracts, for example, breaks it into four, uh, four two mm -hmm. or a 16 bit. Um, so here, divider, same way. The only thing to really note here is that the quotient and the remainder, they get stacked. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have quotient zero, uh, remainder one, quotient one, remainder one. You know, you're going to have that sort of uh, deal going on there. And this is so, this is actually kind of what the uh, case statement does. It breaks it up into four separate lanes. Uh, this is the zero, one, two, and third lane. Um, one thing to note is each lane won't carry over into the next lane. If this results in a carry, it's not going to carry over into this lane. It's four separate operations mm -hmm. not affected by the other lanes and then they are stored into the uh, respective bytes of the RD register that's the destination. And then same thing here with the uh, dual 16. Again, if this carries, it's not gonna affect this operation over here. And it stores in the lower 16 bits of this register and then the upper 16 bits of this register. And so that's how a multiplying divide would break down. Um, it's kind of like saying how they're stacked mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. uh, they're next to each other. Same multiply low, multiply high, those are also packed together. Um, and then you'll see the 16-bit version does exactly the same thing. Try to keep it simple. Um, so here's an example with a quad 8 add, uh, how it actually break down. You'll see in binary how the lines uh, separate the lanes there. Uh, and it's just done on one group. So carries are completely ignored um, at this point in time. And the multiply uh, works the same way, That's hence the color coding. You'll see, for example, the purple at the end there, 0, 09 times 13 x, uh, you get 0, 0, 008b, packed into the low there. Um, on the other hand, the blue, the 18ac, those get multiplied, you get 1020, those go on the upper, uh, the high. It's intended to mimic the regular MIPS data pack, the high mm -hmm. low mm -hmm. sort of thing going on. 16 bit, exactly how you're probably expecting it to work. Exactly the same, 5309 times 24, 13, you get that. Uh, and same thing for those. Mm -hmm. So here are um, some more general purpose instructions that we added. Uh, we've got a rotate right, uh, branch uh, divided by zero true, branch divided by zero is false. Uh, this is a uh, bit set and bit clear. Uh, we'll go into more detail later from that. And then uh, reverse ND and uh, reverse bit and reverse. Reverse bit, and, yeah. Uh, so this is how actually the divide by zero flag is actually implemented in. Uh, it's in the divide by, uh, it's in the division module in the regular 32-bit ALU. Um, first we cast the 32-bit as ints, and then we actually check if t was equal to all zeros. If it was, the divide by zero flag is set and we don't do the division, mm -hmm. else we're just going to do the division and set the flag to zero. And you can see if divide by zero is true, if we're dividing um, R4 by R3, and R3 had a zero. Uh, after the evaluation, the flag was set. In this case, we would jump to the label plus the PC into the PC. Using the same example for false, uh, since we did divide by zero, after evaluation, we're not gonna branch because the flag was set. It does look the same. Right, so this one's not gonna jump, or this one's going to jump because the flag was set, and since the flag wasn't set here, 
and it's checking uh, if the flag uh, was zero, okay. it's not going to branch. Okay. Okay. And so this is uh, bit set immediate and bit clear immediate. Now this is really uh, where we're trying to, you'll notice the focus on embedded systems and a flexible design. Um, if you're like me, you've coded um, some sort of microcontroller and you have to deal with some sort of register, like say um, you're trying to enable parity. All you want to do is just enable that one bit. So what this does is bit set will allow you to set any of the 32 bits in a register. Uh, it's just more of a convenient way. Yeah, you could OR it in, but this is a much cleaner way and a little bit easier to comprehend. Um, and so what you do, for example there with the bit set, uh, you'll see um, how it's actually done is we have to um, shift out anything unnecessary, leaving the five bits there as an index, um, and then it'll set that appropriate bit to one. Same thing with the clear, it's just gonna clear it to zero. Um, yeah, uh, this is gonna be expanded later to be a range as well, so if you're trying to set a whole register like eight bits at once, you can set any random eight bits you want in a register. Um, this is the start of that. Mm -hmm. RB and RBO, uh, RB is reverse bits, so you just completely flip them the other way around. Um, and that's just done with a simple for loop that's just transposing them. The LSB becomes the MSB, MSB becomes the LSB. Um, and then RBO is reverse byte order. That's to reverse Indianness. So like, this is a big Indian machine, so if your data is in little Indian format for whatever reason, it'll reverse it. You can see there EFCD3412 gets reassembled as 1234CDEF. Um, that's simply just transposing the bits like you did in a reverse bit. What would you use a uh, reverse byte order for? Uh, like if your data is, the endianness is for some reason re reversed. Like you're, you're reading from memory and you're not getting what you expected and you notice that you didn't store it correctly. You can reverse it. Application wise though, did you guys find out any applications of why you would do that? That was, it wasn't any particular example. It was more of just I thought in my head, because I've actually done that myself. Don't laugh, I've done it, you know? So I thought maybe that would actually be helpful. I'm not the only one that might have had this problem. No, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's done in a number of processors. So I just wondered if you found out why they do it. No. <laughs> so, you know, inter machines interfacing on the internet, what they put out in memory. So if you're gonna have machine to machine that does it different ways, they can, right. the software takes advantage of that or it has knowledge of that, and then it just flips the bits for its native processing. Um, good. And so for our future plans, uh, we want to expand the plot 8 dual 16, have loads and stories. Um, that's rather obvious. We really, really wanted to get that done uh, for today, but just didn't have it at the time. Uh, we also want a lane control and a barrel shifter per lane. Um, those, the res field yeah, can be yeah. used for that. And then the secondary data path or coprocessor, there's already the workings there for it. Um, it can do regular operations. If the mode select is zero, zero, it'll act as a standard data path. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of already there. The flags are kind of already there. Yeah. So the next logical step would be a register file and making it like its own coprocessor. You could see how it would not be hard to make uh, significant changes pretty quickly. Yeah, Absolutely. If you had the time. Yeah. I was going to ask. Uh, since it's a separate unit that runs in parallel, your VOU, it's got a separate register file, right? Or no. Okay, it doesn't. It doesn't. So, yeah. did you think about reason. having a separate one? You could. Yes. In fact, I really would have liked to have had one. Um, it was just I didn't think it was a achievable amount of time. Um, it's a really easy thing to make. Yeah. Um, it needs it. At this point, the program would have to be careful and know what data is in what register. You know, it's not a dedicated space. Well, it's, yeah, yeah, just be like a separate unit with a different size. And, exactly. And when they want to use it, they, they use it. It doesn't mean that they ha would have to go back and forth between. You know, it's just a separate set of enhanced registers. So I think yeah. in the ARM, it's not the same register file. No. Yeah. So then you go 128 or 256 is common. 128 is about nominal, mm -hmm. and 256 is more the common. Yeah, we scaled it down. I, I believe Neon is 128. Yeah. But we scaled it yeah. down to mimic the simplicity of a MIPS machine. And it's still, it's still cool. I mean, again, all these things are pretty easily implemented once you've done as much as you've done. Absolutely. If you had five more weeks, what could you do? <laughs> or, all this? Yeah. <laughs> I believe it. The last one would be pipelining. Um, it's set up to pipeline. Yeah. It's got the stages in there. 
um, it wasn't exactly our forethought. We wanted to get all of this on the board mm -hmm. and kind of have like a good framework going for like a versatile embedded process. Mm -hmm. And then we would implement pipeline. So, any questions? Good job. Thank you.